A Room with a View by E. M. Forster. Chapter Six. The Reverend Arthur Beebe, the Reverend Cuthbert Eager, Mr. Emerson, Mr. George Emerson, Miss Eleanor Lavish, Miss Charlotte Bartlett, and Miss Lucy Honeychurch drive out in carriages to see a view. Italians drive them. It was Phaeton who drove them to Fiesole that memorable day, a youth all irresponsibility and fire, recklessly urging his master's horses up the stony hill. Mr. Beebe recognized him at once. Neither the ages of faith nor the age of doubt had touched him. He was Phaeton in Tuscany driving a cab. And it was Persephone whom he asked leave to pick up on the way, saying that she was his sister. Persephone tall and slender and pale, returning with the spring to her mother's cottage, and still shading her eyes from the unaccustomed light. To her Mr. Eager objected, saying that here was the thin edge of the wedge, and one must guard against imposition. But the ladies interceded, and when it had been made clear that it was a very great favour, the goddess was allowed to mount beside the god. Phaeton at once slipped the left rein over her head thus enabling himself to drive with his arm round her waist. She did not mind. Mr. Eager, who sat with his back to the horses, saw nothing of the indecorous proceeding, and continued his conversation with Lucy. The other two occupants of the carriage were old Mr. Emerson and Miss Lavish. For a dreadful thing had happened. Mr. Beebe, without consulting Mr. Eager, had doubled the size of the party and though Miss Bartlett and Miss Lavish had planned all the morning how people were to sit, at the critical moment when the carriages came round they lost their heads, and Miss Lavish got in with Lucy, while Miss Bartlett with George Emerson and Mr. Beebe followed on behind. It was hard on the poor chaplain to have his party carré thus transformed. Tea at a Renaissance villa, if he had ever meditated it, was now impossible. Lucy and Miss Bartlett had a certain style about them, and Mr. Beebe, though unreliable, was a man of parts. But a shoddy lady writer and a journalist who had murdered his wife in the sight of God, they should enter no villa at his introduction. Lucy, elegantly dressed in white, sat erect and nervous amid these explosive ingredients, attentive to Mr. Eager, repressive towards Miss Lavish, watchful of old Mr. Emerson hitherto fortunately asleep, thanks to a heavy lunch and the drowsy atmosphere of spring. She looked on the expedition as the work of fate. But for it she would have avoided George Emerson successfully. In an open manner he had shown that he wished to continue their intimacy. She had refused, not because she disliked him, but because she did not know what had happened, and suspected that he did know, and this frightened her. For the real event, whatever it was, had taken place, not in the loggia, but by the river. To behave wildly at the sight of death is pardonable, but to discuss it afterwards, to pass from discussion into silence, and through silence into sympathy, that is an error, not of a startled emotion, but of the whole fabric. There was really something blameworthy, she thought, in their joint contemplation of the shadowy stream in the common impulse which had turned them to the house without the passing of a look or word. This sense of wickedness had been slight at first. She had nearly joined the party to the Torre del Gallo. But each time that she avoided George it became more imperative that she should avoid him again. And now celestial irony, working through her cousin and two clergymen, did not suffer her to leave Florence till she had made this expedition with him through the hills. Meanwhile Mr. Eager held her in civil converse. Their little tiff was over. "'So, Miss Honeychurch, you are travelling, as a student of art?' "'Oh, dear me, no! Oh, no!' "'Perhaps as a student of human nature,' interposed Miss Lavish. "'Like myself?' "'Oh, no! I am here as a tourist.' "'Oh, indeed,' said Mr. Eager. "'Are you, indeed? If you will not think me rude—' We residents sometimes pity you poor tourists, not a little, handed about like a parcel of goods from Venice to Florence, from Florence to Rome, living herded together in pensions or hotels, quite unconscious of anything that is outside Baedeker, 
their one anxiety to get done or through, and go on somewhere else. The result is, they mix up towns, rivers, palaces, in one inextricable whirl. You know the American girl in Punch, who says, "'Say, Papa, what did you see at Rome?' And the father replies, "'Why, guess Rome was the place where we saw the yaller dog. <laughs> There's travelling for you. Ha, ha, ha!' "'I quite agree.' said Miss Lavish, who had several times tried to interrupt his mordant wit. "'The narrowness and superficiality of the Anglo-Saxon tourist is nothing less than a menace.' "'Quite so. Now of the English colony at Florence, Miss Honeychurch, and it is of considerable size, though of course not all equally. A few are here for trade, for example, but the greater part are students. Lady Helen Laverstock is at present busy over Fra Angelico. I mention her name because we are passing her villa on the left. No, you can only see it if you stand. No, do not stand. You will fall. She is very proud of that thick hedge. Inside, perfect seclusion. One might have gone back six hundred years. Some critics believe that her garden was the scene of the Decameron, which lends it an additional interest, does it not? It does indeed, cried Miss Lavish. Tell me— where do they place the scene of that wonderful seventh day?" But Mr. Eager proceeded to tell Miss Honeychurch that on the right lived Mr. Someone Something, an American of the best type, so rare, and that the somebody else's were farther down the hill. Doubtless you know her monographs in the series of medieval byways. He is working at Gemisthus Pletho. Sometimes, as I take tea in their beautiful grounds, I hear, over the wall, the electric tram squealing up the new road with its load of hot, dusty, unintelligent tourists who are going to do Fiesole in an hour, in order that they may say they have been there. And I think—I think—I think how little they think what lies so near to them." During this speech the two figures on the box were sporting with each other disgracefully. Lucy had a spasm of envy. Granted that they wished to misbehave, it was pleasant for them to be able to do so. They were probably the only people enjoying the expedition. The carriage swept with agonizing jolts up through the piazza of Fiesole and into the Serignano Road. "'Piano, piano,' said Mr. Eager, elegantly waving his hand over his head. "'Va bene, signore, va bene, va bene,' crooned the driver, and whipped his horses up again. Now Mr. Eager and Miss Lavish began to talk against each other on the subject of Alessio Baldovinetti. Was he a cause of the Renaissance, or was he one of its manifestations? The other carriage was left behind. As the pace increased to a gallop, the large slumbering form of Mr. Emerson was thrown against the chaplain with the regularity of a machine. "'Piano! Piano!' said he, with a martyred look at Lucy. An extra lurch made him turn angrily in his seat. Phaeton, who for some time had been endeavouring to kiss Persephone, had just succeeded. A little scene ensued, which, as Miss Bartlett said afterwards, was most unpleasant. The horses were stopped, the lovers were ordered to disentangle themselves, the boy was to lose his pourboire, the girl was immediately to get down. "'She is my sister,' said he turning round on them with piteous eyes. Mr. Eager took the trouble to tell him that he was a liar. Phaeton hung down his head, not at the matter of the accusation, but at its manner. At this point Mr. Emerson, whom the shock of stopping had awoken, declared that the lovers must on no account be separated, and patted them on the back to signify his approval. And Miss Lavish, though unwilling to ally with him, felt bound to support the cause of bohemianism. "'Most certainly I would let them be,' she cried. "'But I dare say I shall receive scant support. I have always flown in the face of the conventions all my life. This is what I call an adventure.' "'We must not submit,' said Mr. Eager. "'I knew he was trying it on. He is treating us as if we were a party of Cook's tourists.' "'Surely no,' said Miss Lavish, her ardour visibly decreasing. 
The other carriage had drawn up behind, and sensible Mr. Beebe called out that after this warning the couple would be sure to behave themselves properly. "'Leave them alone!' Mr. Emerson begged the chaplain, of whom he stood in no awe. "'Do we find happiness so often that we should turn it off the box when it happens to sit there? To be driven by lovers! A king might envy us, and if we part them it's more like sacrilege than anything I know.' Here the voice of Miss Bartlett was heard saying that a crowd had begun to collect. Mr. Eager, who suffered from an overfluent tongue rather than a resolute will, was determined to make himself heard. He addressed the driver again. Italian in the mouth of Italians is a deep-voiced stream, with unexpected cataracts and boulders to preserve it from monotony. In Mr. Eager's mouth it resembled nothing so much as an acid, whistling fountain which played ever higher and higher, and quicker and quicker, and more and more shrilly, till abruptly it was turned off with a click. "'Signorina,' said the man to Lucy, when the display had ceased. Why should he appeal to Lucy? "'Signorina,' echoed Persephone in her glorious contralto. She pointed at the other carriage. Why? For a moment the two girls looked at each other. Then Persephone got down from the box. "'Victory at last!' said Mr. Eager, smiting his hands together as the carriage is started again. "'It is not victory,' said Mr. Emerson. "'It is defeat. You have parted two people who were happy.' Mr. Eager shut his eyes. He was obliged to sit next to Mr. Emerson, but he would not speak to him. The old man was refreshed by sleep, and took up the matter warmly. He commanded Lucy to agree with him. He shouted for support to his son. "'We have tried to buy what cannot be bought with money. He has bargained to drive us, and he is doing it. We have no rights over his soul.' Miss Lavish frowned. It is hard when a person you have classed as typically British speaks out of his character. "'He was not driving as well,' she said. He jolted us. That I deny. It was as restful as sleeping. Aha! He is jolting us now. Can you wonder? He would like to throw us out, and most certainly he is justified. And if I were superstitious I'd be frightened of the girl, too. It doesn't do to injure young people. Have you ever heard of Lorenzo de' Medici?" Miss Lavish bristled. Most certainly I have. Do you refer to Lorenzo il Magnifico? or to Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, or to Lorenzo, surnamed Lorenzino, on account of his diminutive stature. The Lord knows. Probably he does know, for I refer to Lorenzo the poet. He wrote a line, so I heard yesterday, which runs like this. Don't go fighting against the spring. Mr. Eager could not resist the opportunity for erudition. Non fate guerra al maggio, he murmured. War not with the May would render a correct meaning. The point is, we have warred with it. Look! He pointed to the Val d'Arno, which was visible far below them, through the budding trees. Fifty miles of spring, and we've come up to admire them. Do you suppose there's any difference between spring in nature and spring in man? But there we go, praising the one and condemning the other as improper, ashamed that the same laws work eternally through both. No one encouraged him to talk. Presently Mr. Eager gave a signal for the carriages to stop, and marshalled the party for their ramble on the hill. A hollow like a great amphitheatre, full of terraced steps and misty olives, now lay between them and the heights of Fiesole, and the road, still following its curve, was about to sweep on to a promontory which stood out into the plain. It was this promontory, uncultivated, wet, covered with bushes and occasional trees, which had caught the fancy of Alessio Baldovinetti nearly five hundred years before. He had ascended it, that diligent and rather obscure master, possibly with an eye to business, possibly for the joy of ascending. Standing there, he had seen that view of the Val d'Arno and distant Florence, which he afterwards had introduced not very effectively into his work. But where exactly had he stood? That was the question which Mr. Eager hoped to solve now and Miss Lavish, whose nature was attracted by anything problematical, had become equally enthusiastic. But it is not easy to carry the pictures of Alessio Baldovinetti in your head, even if you have remembered to look at them before starting. 
and the haze in the valley increased the difficulty of the quest. The party sprang about from tuft to tuft of grass, their anxiety to keep together being only equalled by their desire to go in different directions. Finally they split into groups. Lucy clung to Miss Bartlett and Miss Lavish, the Emersons returned to hold laborious converse with the drivers, while the two clergymen, who were expected to have topics in common, were left to each other. The two elder ladies soon threw off the mask. In the audible whisper that was now so familiar to Lucy, they began to discuss, not Alessio Baldovinetti, but the drive. Miss Bartlett had asked Mr. George Emerson what his profession was, and he had answered, the railway. She was very sorry that she had asked him. She had no idea that it would be such a dreadful answer, or she would not have asked him. Mr. Beebe had turned the conversation so cleverly, and she hoped that the young man was not very much hurt at her asking him. "'The railway!' gasped Miss Lavish. "'Oh, but I shall die. Of course it was the railway.' She could not control her mirth. "'He is the image of a porter. On—on the southeastern. "'Eleanor, be quiet!' plucking at her vivacious companion. "'Hush! They'll hear! The Emersons!' "'I can't stop. Let me go my wicked way. A porter!' "'Eleanor!' "'I'm sure it's all right,' put in Lucy. "'The Emersons won't hear, and they wouldn't mind if they did.' Miss Lavish did not seem pleased at this. "'Miss Honeychurch listening?' she said rather crossly. "'Poof! Woof! You naughty girl! Go away!' "'Oh, Lucy, you ought to be with Mr. Eager, I'm sure.' "'I can't find them now, and I don't want to, either.' "'Mr. Eager will be offended. It is your party.' "'Please, I'd rather stop here with you.' "'No, I agree,' said Miss Lavish. "'It's like a school feast. The boys have got separated from the girls. Miss Lucy, you are to go. We wish to converse on high topics unsuited for your ear.' The girl was stubborn. As her time at Florence drew to its close, she was only at ease amongst those to whom she felt indifferent. Such a one was Miss Lavish, and such for the moment was Charlotte. She wished she had not called attention to herself. They were both annoyed at her remark and seemed determined to get rid of her. "'How tired one gets,' said Miss Bartlett. "'Oh, I do wish Freddy and your mother could be here.' Unselfishness with Miss Bartlett had entirely usurped the functions of enthusiasm. Lucy did not look at the view either. She would not enjoy anything till she was safe in Rome. "'Then sit you down,' said Miss Lavish. "'Observe my foresight.' With many a smile she produced two of those Mackintosh squares that protect the frame of the tourist from damp grass or cold marble steps. She sat on one. Who was to sit on the other? Oh, Lucy, without a moment's doubt, Lucy, the ground will do for me. Really, I have not had rheumatism for years. If I do feel it coming on, I shall stand. Imagine your mother's feelings if I let you sit on the wet in your white linen." She sat down heavily where the ground looked particularly moist. "'Here we are, all settled delightfully. Even if my dress is thinner, it will not show so much, being brown. Sit down, dear. You are too unselfish. You don't assert yourself enough. She cleared her throat. <clears> throat> now, don't be alarmed. This isn't a cold. It's the tiniest cough, and I have had it three days. It's nothing to do with sitting here at all. There was only one way of treating the situation. At the end of five minutes, Lucy departed in search of Mr. Beebe and Mr. Eager, vanquished by the Mackintosh Square. She addressed herself to the drivers, who were sprawling in the carriages, perfuming the cushions with cigars. The miscreant, a bony young man scorched black by the sun, rose to greet her with the courtesy of a host and the assurance of a relative. Dove, said Lucy, after much anxious thought. His face lit up. Of course he knew where. Not so far, either. His arm swept three-fourths of the horizon. He should just think he did know where. He pressed his fingertips to his forehead, and then pushed them towards her, as if oozing with visible extract of knowledge. More seemed necessary. What was the Italian for clergyman? "'Dove buoni uomini,' said she at last. "'Good! Scarcely the adjective for those noble beings.' He showed her his cigar. "'Uno piu piccolo?' 
was her next remark, implying, "'Has the cigar been given to you by Mr. Beebe, the smaller of the two good men?' She was correct, as usual. He tied the horse to the tree, kicked it to make it stay quiet, dusted the carriage, arranged his hair, remoulded his hat, encouraged his moustache, and in rather less than a quarter of a minute was ready to conduct her. Italians are born knowing the way. It would seem that the whole earth lay before them, not as a map, but as a chessboard, whereon they continually behold the changing pieces as well as the squares. Any one can find places, but the finding of people is a gift from God. He only stopped once, to pick her some great blue violets. She thanked him with real pleasure. In the company of this common man the world was beautiful and direct. For the first time she felt the influence of spring. His arms swept the horizon gracefully. Violets, like other things, existed in great profusion there. Would she like to see them? Ma buoni uomini? He bowed. Certainly. Good men first, violets afterwards. They proceeded briskly through the undergrowth, which became thicker and thicker. They were nearing the edge of the promontory, and the view was stealing round them, but the brown network of the bushes shattered it into countless pieces. He was occupied in his cigar, and in holding back the pliant boughs. She was rejoicing in her escape from dullness. Not a step, not a twig was unimportant to her. "'What is that?' There was a voice in the wood in the distance behind them. The voice of Mr. Eager? He shrugged his shoulders. An Italian's ignorance is something more remarkable than his knowledge. She could not make him understand that perhaps they had missed the clergyman. The view was forming at last. She could discern the river, the golden plain, other hills. Eccolo! he exclaimed. At the same moment the ground gave way, and with a cry she fell out of the wood. Light and beauty enveloped her. She had fallen on to a little open terrace, which was covered with violets from end to end. "'Courage!' cried her companion, now standing some six feet above. "'Courage! And love!' She did not answer. From her feet the ground sloped sharply into the view, and violets ran down in rivulets and streams and cataracts, irrigating the hillside with blue, eddying round the tree-stems, collecting into pools in the hollows, covering the grass with spots of azure foam. But never again were they in such profusion. This terrace was the wellhead, the primal source whence beauty gushed out to water the earth. Standing at its brink, like a swimmer who prepares, was the good man. But he was not the good man that she had expected, and he was alone. George had turned at the sound of her arrival. For a moment he contemplated her, as one who had fallen out of heaven. He saw radiant joy in her face, he saw the flowers beat against her dress in blue waves. The bushes above them closed, he stepped quickly forward and kissed her. Before she could speak, almost before she could feel, a voice called, "'Lucy! Lucy! Lucy!' The silence of life had been broken by Miss Bartlett, who stood brown against the view. End of chapter 6